All right, can you hear me? Good, all right. So, transfusion. Um, transfusions and confusion. They go together. So, um, I have no, just no financial interest in anything I'm going to tell you. A lot of um, new things are coming out about transfusion, and I don't have enough time to talk about all of them, but I'll, I will mention the restrictive transfusion policy, uh, mass transfusion policy. Um, I don't think we'll have time to get the preoperative anemia policy, but there is one. Uh, which is designed to try to prevent um, transfusions in surgical patients. And we'll talk about plasma and some of the recent trials uh, that have come out just in the last uh, month or two. So I have a long-standing interest in blood transfusion. This is a picture from my long-forgotten master's thesis, but my thesis was to try to take uh, pig cells, pig red cells, and make them compatible with humans. As a and the reason wasn't because I was trying to uh, transfuse pig blood in the humans, but we knew that um, transgenic pigs were on the horizon. This is way back in the early early 90s, so we knew that there'd be transgenic pigs, and so the idea was if we could, in those transgenic pigs, grow up human bloodlines, we could have a potential source of blood and organs for transplant that would actually be human organs grown in pigs. So. Um, and so this is basically what cross-match looks like. So tube number one, you can see the red cells, there's some gel in that tube. They didn't go through the gel. And so that's called a four plus reaction, which means they're incompatible. But tubes two and three, the red cells went all the way through the gel to the bottom of the tube. And those are red cells that uh, I had treated with enzymes and had basically put um, PEG or polyethylene glycol, glycol onto the red cells so that the human antibodies could not bind to the pig cells. And you can see um, they actually would pass a cross-match reaction. Um, the only problem was to make a little more than that amount of blood was about $10,000. So not fiscally, <laughs> but as a proof of concept, uh, that's what it was. So um, so that's that was my, uh, my project. But interested in blood uh, for a long time. Um, so. This case, many of you will recall this case uh, from a couple of years ago. Uh, it was a 30-year-old woman who came in um, for um, uh, planned cesarean uh, with twins. And uh, past medical history wasn't particularly um, interesting or problematical. Her preoperative care had been unremarkable, um, not unusual medications, uh, typical allergies. She was OK with the concept of the blood transfusion when it was discussed. And so she was admitted for C-section. Uh, Preoperative hemoglobin was nine. Intraoperatively, uh, a little bloodier than usual, uh, twin delivery, but um, blood loss was about a liter. Uh, but patient otherwise did well. Postoperatively was stable. Had a little, little uh, low urine up with first night in L and D. Babies are doing good. Um, pain control was a little bit of an issue. Um, first hemoglobin post-op came back at seven, and so. Patient is asymptomatic, so the resident overnight to start the patient on iron and, and colase. On the second post-op day, the hemoglobin came back at uh, 6.7. And the resident wrote in the note, uh, patient seen, discuss hemoglobin 6.7, discuss risk of infection, risk of transfusion reaction with patient. Patient consents some blood transfusion, consent sign. Patient was given, uh, ordered then two units of blood. First uh, unit of blood went fine. The second unit of blood, about 3 o'clock that afternoon, um, something bad was starting to happen. The attending was called and wrote down, patient is shaking with rigors, temperature 99 to 100, mild hypertension, tachycardia 170, screaming in pain, bilateral lower extremity and back spasms, O2 sat 90 degrees, rapid response called, RN at stop blood, due to semi pain component, parent panic attack, and during due possible blood transfusion reaction, final grams of morphine, pushed IV, episode rapidly de-escalated, patient remained mildly elevated, blood pressure lower to 120s, patient became calm, and his seizure arrived, no, events, uh, no evidence of cardiovascular event. EKG showed sinus tachycardia. Abdominal exam not remarkable. Nothing seen in the extremities. Chest was clear, but she was hypertensive and tachycardic. She was given a valol for that. Blood transfusion had been stopped. They sent off the transfusion reaction labs. Um, and because of the patient's um, uh, findings, um, they suggested transfer to the ICU. They did call blood, the blood bank right away. They did a reverse cross match on the transfused blood, and they said, no, this is not an ABO reaction. So in the ICU, however, um, patient began to deteriorate by 816. 
um, a transfusion reaction showed that a uh, workup that showed that, that the blood bag that was sent had bacteria in it, gram negative rods on a smear, which is very unusual. So the patient was started on vancosin. Her white count dropped to one. Fibrinogen was still okay. RNR was went from one to two point six. Patient was seen to be shocky, cool, and pale. Lines were placed in the ICU. Our first blood gas showed pH seven point two seven. A PCO2 of 13, PO2 of 139, base deficit of minus 18. By 10 o'clock that night, she was in shock, intubated on levofed, and she was very anemic with a hemoglobin of 4.6. She was given four units of Paxels, two units of FFP, one unit of platelets. Things continued to get worse. Uh, the next morning, she was so acidotic as she required bicarb drip. She had no urine output, creatinine already gone up to 1.5. She was started on CRT. Her abdomen was distended, but her bladder pressure was only 10. She was taken to the operating room um, because of the distended abdomen, thinking that there was bleeding. They found a lot of blood in the belly, but no active bleeding source, what's so-called non-surgical bleeding. And by this time, she had had eight units of pack cells, four units of FFP, four units of platelets, 20 units of cryo. Day four, she was in severe shock, uh, very hypoglycemic. She was on three pressors, needed continuous blood transfusions to keep her hemoglobin up. The Blood sample taken from the transfuse bag, not from the patient, came back showing Pseudomonas fluorescence, which is a um, bacteria. Patient uh, had a TAG exam which showed fibrinolysis. She was given TXA. Despite maximal pressure, she remained hypotensive. She was given hydrocortisone effect, uh, hydrocortisone, which did not help her blood pressure. She was given methylene blue in case she had vasoplegia, which had some mild effect on her blood pressure. Patient needed another six units of pack cells, seven units of FFP, one unit of platelets. This is the TAG exam that was done on day four, and uh, the, the exam actually didn't finish, but I'll just explain a bit about what this exam actually is. So this is not a new test. The TAG has actually been around since World War II. It was actually invented in Germany. Um, but basically what it is, it's a test of the thickness, or the, what they call viscoelastic properties of blood. So looking at the tag, you can see what over time, how thick the blood is, how it clots, and then how it may, um, lies after it's been clotted. And so there's a bunch of numbers and stuff on here. It looks fairly complicated, but actually it's a, a fairly simple test, uh, but it does require some interpretation. So, um, but you'll see that the tag always starts with a straight line, and then two lines spread apart. And the two lines are actually mirror images of each other. Um, and that's because of the way the original test worked and how it read out. Um, if the tests were invented today, you would probably just see the upper half of the line, but there's two lines and there's a reason for that. It's because old doctors used to the old tags are used to seeing the two sides of the line and the shape of the tag, which would tell you something about the blood clotting. Um, in this case, um, there's a couple of things that are significantly um, positive and something called EPL, which is the estimated percent lysis is 17 which means the blood after having clotted is beginning to lyse, which is a sign that the fibrinolytic system is too active. So blood clotting is always a balance between clotting and lysing of blood. Um, we have a clotting cascade because the reason we have so many different clotting factors is it's to help balance the amount of clot at any one time. So patients who have sepsis, patients who have trauma, they need to make some clot but you don't want to have so much clot that it actually clots off the small, small blood vessels and you lose perfusion. So there's always a balance between coagulation and, and fibrinolysis or anticoagulation. Normally, however, when a clot forms, it usually lasts for at least half an hour. And what this tag is showing us is that there's initially no clot. The clot shows up a bit late. And then the patient has clotting, which is kind of weak. And then the patient's clot begins to break down, which is not normal. And I'll show you a bit more how that actually works. So, um, so the test is very crude. Um, what there is basically is the blood is, uh, blood is put into a little cup, a little plastic cup. And inside the cup sits a little pin, usually a T-shaped pin. And depending on which brand of machine you have, the cup rotates back and forth, oscillates back and forth, or the needle oscillates back and forth. And then that's connected to either a sensor. In the old machine, it was actually directly connected to a pen. And a piece of paper would come out. 
if there was no clot, then the blood was liquid and the pen would, would not move. But as the blood began to clot and that thing was moving, what would happen is the needle would begin to move with the clot because the clot would make them put some torque on the needle. So what would happen is you get a straight line and then because the paper was moving so slow, you get a black um, shape that would gradually get wider and wider and wider as the clot got stronger. So that gave you a lot of information. How long it took for the clot to show up was a piece of information. How quickly the clot was formed once it started to form was some information. How strong the clot got by how wide it got was some information. And then whether or not the clot stuck around or whether it began to break down because the fibrinolytic system was starting to work. Um, so that's how this test would work. And the original, um, the original machine literally gave you these black lines. It used to look like this. The paper would move so slowly. So the top one is normal. So you see a little short period of straight line. And then very quickly, you can see the line, the, the pen is spreading out because the clot is forming in the cup. And you get a nice rapid uh, formation of clot. And then the clot stays strong for the duration of that, that strip. Um, the one below is somebody who's on warfarin. Then you can see it takes a long time for the clot to form. And when it does form, it forms, it's kind of pointy because the clot's forming slowly. And the clot is not as strong. You can see that the, um, uh, the width is not as tall, it's not as wide as the top one. The person next, the third one down is somebody on aspirin. Clot forms relatively quickly, but the clot is weak because platelets aren't working very good under aspirin. Um, the one, the fourth one, that's sometimes called the diamond of death, clot shows up a bit late. Clot begins to form and almost immediately lyses. We see this in patients with severe trauma, sometimes in patients with sepsis, sometimes in a liver transplant patient it's bleeding. But that's fibrinolysis, excess fibrinolysis. It's often seen in patients with a lot of tissue factor floating around from severe injury. But basically, they're breaking down their clots very quickly. The fifth one down is somebody who's hypercoagulable. Um, the blood's liquid only for a short time, and then very rapidly you get a rapid clot formation and the clot's very wide. So that patient's hypercoagulable. We used to not worry about this very much, but there's actually um, evidence now that um, where too much fibrinolysis is a bad thing, no fibrinolysis is also a bad thing. And that could be a sign that somebody is actually, their, their anticoagulant system is no longer working. And we see this sometimes in severe trauma, and particularly in severe brain injury. And so this is a very common finding in the older patient who's fallen down and has a severe TBI. Um, and it's evidence that they're no longer able to break down their clot, which is abnormal. And that actually may be a sign that they're um, going to have uh, high risk of mortality. So that term is called fibrinolysis shutdown. So too much fibrinolysis, bad. Not enough fibrinolysis, also bad. So there's kind of a Goldilocks in between. Um, and the two bottom ones are what we see in what we used to call DIC, but basically you can see a, a normal clot kind of form is, but then it breaks down, which is a sign that's common in things like sepsis. The one on the bottom, um, the clot comes late, and then when it does form, it's very weak, which is another sign of, of uh, what used to be called DIC. So our patient of all these ones, she looks more like the second one from the bottom, and this is somebody who is kind of a kind of um, has coagulation but then breaks it down and that's a bad sign for patients in shock or with trauma. So, so just to summarize on the, how the TEG works, the first line, the, uh, until the first clot shows up, that is called the enzymatic phase and that has to do with clotting factors. So for instance, the patient has no clotting factors, this line will be very long. Or if the patient's on warfarin or, or heparin, this line will also be very long. And then um, if the patient's hypercoagulable, the line may be very short, but it's the first one. That's called the R time, the time of the first reaction. Then the next phase is how quickly the clot begins to form as it forms. And that's called, that's called the kinetic phase or uh, clot kinetics. And there's two measurements that can be made here. One, um, you can measure the amount of time for one centimeter of deviation on what would have been the old paper chart, or the angle between the start of clotting and one centimeter of deviation. But basically, it's an idea of how steep that curve is. So when clot is forming very quickly, this line becomes quite steep. That's a sign clot's forming really fast. In order for that to happen, there has to be 
a kind of a Goldilocks relationship. You know, there's just enough, the right amount of platelets and the right amount of clotting factors and the right uh, amount of um, fiber engine around. Everything is just perfect and clot forms very quickly. If that's not the case, though, if something is missing, the clot, the tag becomes pointy. And so we talk about pointy tags. That means that something is wrong. Does, you may not know which one it is. It could be fibrinogen, it could be platelets, but something is not in the right ratio. And that's what the, the K or alpha is about. Then the width of the clot, that's mostly about platelets. You don't ever have clot without platelets. Platelets are the one thing that always have to be present for clot to form. And so the width of the clot has to do with how many platelets. So patients who have platelet problems or platelet deficient, the clot, the tag is skinny. We have a narrow tag. So aspirin will do that. Patients who have uh, liver disease and are thrombocytopenic, they have, a, they have a skinny tag. So your tag can be pointy, which means it's got the wrong, you have the wrong ratio of clotting factors, and it can be skinny, which means you don't have enough platelets. And then finally, the lysis, which is a totally different system than the clotting system. That's the anti-clotting system, the fibrinolytic system, which is always supposed to be working. But if it's a little too active, that tends to mean that things that are out of proportion, the balance between clotting and non-clotting is, is uh, out of whack. And fibrinolysis is interesting because nothing you give will work except uh, TXA. Platelets don't make this better. Plasma doesn't generally make it better. Um, more red cells definitely don't make it better. Warming the patient up may help a little bit, but patients who have fibrinolysis, really the only thing that for them is the tetranzamic acid. So that's why TAG is so important in bleeding patients. If someone's bleeding after a liver transplant or major trauma, and you're throwing products at them and it's not stopping, there's probably the two most likely reasons are there's something in there that needs to be tied off or clipped or something as it's a blood vessel, or they're lysing. And if they're lysing, the really only thing we have for it is TXA, or aminocoproic acid, which is the same thing. And all TXA is, um, it's just long chains of lysine um, peptides. So to the fibrinolytic system, they can't tell that apart. Those enzymes think that's fibrin. So what it does, instead of chewing up a patient's fibrin, it says, Oh, here's some fibrin. It's not fibrin, it's TXA, but they don't know any better, so those enzymes chew that up. So that's how the, the tag is supposed to work. So our patient's lysing. She gets TXA, helps a bit. She goes back to the on the fifth day. They find 10 liters of clot now in the belly. She's bleeding tridominally, but no specific source. Um, she's bleeding from the abdominal wall, the rectus muscles, and um, on the uterus. They treat all this with fibrin glue and fibrin sheets, trying to get some clot to form patient still remains very sick, and transfusion requirements are, are somewhat reduced, though. Um, and then basically, she goes on. She seems to develop necrosis of the abdominal wall. Some pictures of that. She goes back to the OR a further four times. Takes her 11 days to come off pressors. 14 days, she gets her abdominal wall reconstructed. Extubated on 16 days. She also had necrosis in her arm, um, on the arm that was transfused. Um, that's what her belly ended up looking like at 15 days. You can see it's necrotic with retention sutures, did require reconstruction. She eventually had to have a um, uh, abdominal wall hernia. You can also see, it's hard to tell, but there's also a fan and steel incision down here as well. Uh, at the bottom, my mouse will work. Whoops, not that way. Let's go back. There's a, uh, my mouse over there. Hello. Yeah, there's a fan and steel. This is also necrotic down here at the bottom. And that's the arm which became necrotic around the site of the IV. Um, so this was a case of transmitted tr uh, transfusion transmitted bacterial infection. It's called TTBI. Don't memorize that. It's so rare. But um, interesting, our patients, we never got her to grow the pseudomonas. But pseudomonas is a bacteria that produces a lot of toxins. It's the whole family of, 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 of pseudomonas is great at to making toxins. So, um, so very rare to get bacterial infections. It's rated at 0.2 per million PRVCs, only 10 per million plate transfusions, caused 10 deaths in 2014. The usual uh, bacteria is something called Babsio, which causes Babsiosis, but this is, uh, there was only one case of Pseudomonas in 2014. So, but the fact of the matter is, whenever you transfuse somebody, there is a risk. Uh, the risk of bacterial infection is much higher in platelets because how, how, are, platelets trans how are platelets stored? Room temperature, yeah. And how long can you keep in room temperature? 
five days, right? So here's an experiment. You want to understand how platelets are stored. Take a pint of milk, take it out of your fridge on Monday, leave it on the counter until Friday, <laughs> then drink it. <laughs> That's how platelets are stored. So there's an issue, right? Platelets are not great, but even red cells have a risk, you know, because there is a risk of bacterial growth in these things. So the ironic thing was here, did she really need two units of blood? Maybe one, or maybe none. She was young with a hemoglobin of 6.8. So you could argue no transfusion at all. For me, I would say, hell yeah, no, I'll, you know, I'll have some liver, thanks, you know, but I'm not taking, I don't need that unit. But that's what happened. Um, this is the blood was cultured on a culture plate from this patient. This is the culture dish under, under black light, and you can see the culture dish is fluorescing. So pseudomonas fluorescence makes fluorescent compounds. So it's one, of the it's one of the few bacteria that glow in the dark. This is what was growing in the blood bag that she was given. So, um, and the bag, the unit of blood wasn't that old. I think it was only, ta it was only 10 days old. So, so fluid, this is the bacteria. Um, it's actually, it actually makes antibiotics and toxins. It's actually used commercial. Um, Upiracin, um, what's the trade name for that? Um, God, I forgot the name of it. It's, we used to use it all the time for decontaminating the nose, um, Upiracin ointment. That's made from the same bacteria. So this bacteria makes good things and it makes bad things. It makes a useful antibiotic though, Upiracin. Um, it's often used to make yogurt. Um, it also makes all these compounds, which are very nasty compounds to get in your body. Uh, it will kill funguses. It kills zebra mussels. It kills everything <laughs> it gets in contact with. So it's a very interesting bacteria, but not the thing you want to have in your unit of blood. It does have a powerful hemolytic toxin. We saw that with her. It lies her blood. It, it attacked her skin. Um, infects blood products. It also gets into, um, it can get into, um, there was an outbreak in Texas in the 90s where it got into little um, saline bottles. Um, yeah, heparinized flush solution back in 2004. It, it actually uh, killed a bunch of people from that. So, so was this just bad luck? You know, what really happened here? You know, how would you stop this from happening again? Uh, so we often talk about the Swiss cheese theory. This is from a, a doctor, uh, Reason, who talked about in the hospital, our protection against adverse events is basically our, our cells and our safety systems and our protocols. Um, that are supposed to stop harm from reading the patient. But there are latent errors or there are defects we know in our safety systems. And the Swiss cheese theory is that if now and again things don't go perfectly, the holes can line up and harm can reach the, pa reach the patient. Um, and this the example given up here, you know, the first one is funding and resources. You don't have the people, don't have the resources. That, that's a piece of che Swiss cheese. Organization, the culture, incomplete policies. In this case, we had introduced a trans restricted transfusion policy, but it was still in the process of being distributed, and a lot of the OB people didn't know about it yet, um, or didn't hadn't accepted it. Technical, poor designs, um, deferred maintenance of, of equipment, that can be an issue. The team, um, basically responsibilities are shifting, you know, bad handovers, those examples of team things that can go wrong. And the last one is the provider, the training, whether or not they're fatigued, are they distracted, are they really following the protocols we say they were following, or are they kind of taking shortcuts? In this case, you know, the, the physicians involved all thought they were doing the right thing. But in retrospect, if you look at it, you know, this probably could have been avoided. The risk, though, is that if this patient hadn't gotten that unit of pseudomonas blood, somebody else would have gotten it because there's no way to capture that. Now the blood supply is very safe but it's not perfect and they are now looking more and more at ways of processing blood to decrease the risk of bacterial contamination but that adds costs. So for instance it's very likely in the future we're going to have a different processing for platelets but we're looking at that in the future, and the FDA may require it, it's going to about triple or five times the cost of getting platelets. So, but anyway, when we are transfusing, we should be transfusing for really good reasons because casual transfusion has a risk, that's for sure. Um, there's an interesting history of transfusion. Um, the initial transfusions are done around 16, uh, 1660s. Uh, this particular here, Dr. Lower, is um, 
giving it to uh, this fellow by the name, his name was Kogel. Um, he's getting the sheep of a lamb because he was a little bit too rambunctious. His wife would complain that he was a little you know, randy, a little too uh, crazy. So they gave him the sheep of a blood to make him calmer. It worked the first time, but the second time he got very sick. Um, so Dr. Halstead, was, he's considered the, the father of American surgery. Very interesting guy, Halstead. He was a, a paragon of virtue, one of the founders of Johns Hopkins. Had a, had a, uh, a uh, opiate, opium uh, um, addiction nobody knew about except his friend William Osler, who treated him with cocaine. Um, and later when he was buried, they found vials of cocaine sewn into his jacket because he used to inject himself all the time. Anyway, Halstead's sister had a postpartum hemorrhage and was dying. And um, basically, Halstead arranged a person-to-person -person transfusion on the kitchen table, which was pretty risky because at that day and age, there, were no, there was no blood types. So there was a 50-50 chance he would have killed her, but she survived. Uh, back, it was World War I, World War II that uh, blood transfusion really got going. And um, a huge blood transfusion um, uh, effort was made. World War I was the beginning of blood transfusion, but um, it didn't really get well organized until World War II. Anybody know who this is? So this is Charles Drew, who was one of the first um, uh, black American surgeons and was the first person to organize blood banks in World War II. And so, uh, uh, so it, the, the institution of blood banks in the U.S. and becoming highly organized was done by Charles Drew. And so um, uh, that was his legacy. Um, this is an interesting picture. This is from World War II. On the um, left side are two metal cans. That's lyophilized plasma. So it's plasma that's been put in a vacuum chamber and all the water sucked out. So basically all you have left is a, pl is a powder and it's freeze-dried plasma. So the ones on the left are the American version. The ones on the right are the British version. And that's the kit to give the plasma. So you could take this anywhere. It was dry. You uh, Basically, with the American one, you put the two cans together. The British one, you put the two balls together. But the water, the saline would rehydrate the plasma. And with a few minutes, you had a unit of plasma. You could give it anywhere. You could be given the field, battlefield, on an airplane. Fantastic product. Went away. Well, why did it go away? It's expensive, but the other real real was is that um, it was made from pool plasma, so there was a risk of hepatitis B transmission. So the blood it stopped being made. But you know, for trauma and military situations, it's a great a great product. Um, anybody know what this thing is? It's our old friend the Swan Gans catheter, right? So this came out in 1970. And the interesting thing with the Swan Gans catheter, in retrospect, is that it actually doesn't change mortality overall but it does increase the amount of blood and fluid the patient gets. So a lot of the issues we had with excess fluid and excess transfusion uh, throughout the 70s, 80s, 90s um, was probably due to the idea of this, this thing. And we used to worry a lot about critical oxygen delivery, DO2. When I was a medical student and junior resident, we had to go around, shoot the numbers on the, on the swan gans, and you had to be sure to present on rounds that the patients um, the patient's DO2, you know, had to be around 200 or so, otherwise you were not giving enough oxygen delivery. Well, if you think about how can you increase the patient's oxygen delivery, there wasn't many ways of doing that. You basically had to be at least 100, preferably 200. If you look at the oxygen delivery equation, you know, what's in there? Cardiac index times the saturations times the hemoglobin and some conversion factors. Stroke index minus heart rate. Heart rate, you don't want to put that up. Stroke index can't do much with that other than, you know, pressors. So the only thing left in the equation you can fix most of the time was hemoglobin. So more hemoglobin, more oxygen delivery. That's good, right? Mm, turns out it wasn't so good. That's the only thing you can fix. Um, and in fact, there are interesting studies that are done that show what point do the wheels fall off? How low can the hemoglobin go before the patient no longer has enough oxygen delivery to survive? And the numbers are quite consistent. It always seems to come out, in this case, it's hematocrit. Always seems to, uh, this is a percentage of hematocrit, about 25% um, of baseline. And this is interesting. This can't see this too well, but it's man, pig, baboon, dog, and rat. So when it gets down to about one quarter of the starting 
hemoglobin or hematocrit, that's when bad things happen. Well, what number is that? Well, we start at 14 as a hemoglobin. That would be about three and a half hemoglobin, right? That's where bad things happen in all species. And that's quite consistent. So this is an interesting study. It looked at um, 300 Jehovah's Witnesses. Um, in, in, uh, basically, they didn't want to be transfused, and their hemoglobins were going down. At what hemoglobin did people start dying? Um, there were no deaths um, down to six. Once you got a hemoglobin of six, the, the mortality was 14%. Um, when it got to a hemoglobin of 4.1 to 5, then you had a mortality of 58%. Uh, less than 5, 4 to 5, uh, it was uh, 58 And then 3 to 4 was 62%. So patients will tolerate a hemoglobin of 7, fine. We'll all tolerate a hemoglobin, most of the time, a hemoglobin of 6 quite well, too. Might be a juicier uh, that. So, um, the battery's finally dead. Interesting. It means the hemoglobin, the traditional hemoglobin open. I want my patient at 10. Well, it's not actually doing very much. So the critical cutoff is 6.1 to 7. And there's no excess mortality. A big concern for many years is how old the blood was. Who gets the oldest blood in the city? Yeah, why? Yeah. So the freshest blood should go to radies, and then the blood that's not too old will go to hospitals that don't use very much. But if you use blood quickly, you're going to give you the oldest blood. So what's what ends up happening? So, um, you know, the maximum life is actually 42 days. You remember what you were doing 42 days ago? 42 days ago, that's like uh, like the second week in June. Right? And that's when some of those people said, yeah, so that's pretty old. Most of it doesn't get to be that old because of shortages, but it can be that old. Um, you know, the, the red cells, um, after one day in the bag, they only survive 25 days. Um, and after full storage, the red cells only last for 40 hours. So the idea is you're going to bump the hemoglobin up and it's going to stay up. If their bone marrow is not working, the hemoglobin is going to come right back down. Again. So their idea is that one good transfusion patient make the hemoglobin all good forever. No, it's going to last somewhere between two or three days. And that's all going to be gone. Which makes you, shows you how important those transfusions are because you transfuse patients to hemoglobin. Stay up. So what's going on? Yeah, they're still making red cells. They didn't really need that transfusion, probably. Um, it's very acidotic. Um, it doesn't carry oxygen very good at first, but it does get better after a few hours. And then looking at all, there's a whole bunch of papers out there. Um, it seems that newer blood may be slightly better than older blood, if you look at all these meta-analyses together. It seems to have older blood it does have a higher risk of organ failure, but it's not a really strong effect. Um, and it seems that the patients that do best with fresher blood um, is, um, sorry, go back one there. My uh, patients who do best with fresher blood turn out to be um, more, um, uh, it does better for patients who have trauma and cardiac surgery, but not so much for medical patients. So that's who should get the fresher blood. Trauma patients, that, and a group, of course, that should really get it are kids. Um, and there is some evidence, not strong, that kids do better with fresher blood. This is a famous trial that showed the target of seven in critical care. Um, I remember this trial very well because I was a, a resident when it was being done. I was in one of the hospitals the trial was being done. It included uh, ICU patients, but not cardiac patients. You know why cardiac patients weren't involved? because the cardiac surgeons refused to have their patients in the study. So that's why they're not in there. But basically, it showed that mortality was lower. Um, and it only took 17 patients not to be transfused before you saved the life, which is a pretty strong effect. So, so this is um, still a very important trial in, uh, in critical care. So target hemoglobin in the ICU is 7 for anemic patients. If somebody's bleeding, that's a different story. Blood is given for, for shock, that's different. We don't care about the hemoglobin because it could be high or low 
as they're act actually losing blood, you don't really know how much blood they have left by the hemoglobin. But for patients who've been around for a while who are stable, hemoglobin of 7 is just fine. Oh, but my patient has cardiac issues. Well, okay, we'll see about that. Or my patient's special because they just had a GI bleed. Well, as time went by, more studies were done. This study um, is now over 20 years old. But GI bleeds, what's the best threshold for patients who just had a GI bleed? Seven. Oh, I want them at nine in case they bleed again. No, seven. Nine may look better, but actually just increases your risk of death and infection. So the heat heart hemoglobin GI bleeds is seven. Okay, they bleed. Um, not only do they not die as much, they bleed less at a hemoglobin of seven, which is bizarre. But if you give them more blood, the risk of them bleeding actually goes up. So seven is the target. Um, and this especially works in cirrhotics. Well, my patient's cirrhotic. I have a hemoglobin of nine. No, cirrhotics do better at a hemoglobin of seven. The target is seven in GI bleeds. How about traumatic brain injury? Oh, my patient has traumatic brain injury. They need as much oxygen as possible in their brain. Well, no, sorry. Threshold of seven is better for traumatic brain injury and not 10. So sometimes you get somebody saying, oh, you know, my patient's brain needs more oxygen. Not for TBI. Nope. Seven. And it only takes 10 patients um, to show a better outcome and only seven patients to reduce the risk of having a PE or DVT. What about infections? Um, if you use more blood, you will have more infections. And it's all kinds of infections. Pneumonia, UTI, CLAB C's, and um, uh, site infections are all increased by excess transfusion. Um, so patients who got restricted transfusion had a rate of 11% versus liberal transfusion 16.9%. And so the number needed to treat with a restrictive policy, with after 20 patients, you saved one infection. So these are very powerful interventions. We spend millions of dollars on almost useless drugs for very small benefit when the simplest thing we could do for a lot of these patients to prevent infection is not transfuse them. I've had to make this, this very other surgical groups in the institution trying to say, you know, they're complaining about their infection rate and they want to change their hardware and they want to wear space suits in the ICUs, yet they're transfusing all over the place. I'm saying the reason you're getting your infections is not the way you're doing your surgery. It's because you're over transfusing your patients. Doesn't always, they don't always believe it. I have to show them the data. Um, another one showing that um, patients who had restrictive policies, uh, even if they had prior cardiac disease, if they were not transfused as much, they had fewer, less deaths, fewer MIs, fewer strokes, less pneumonia, less VTEs, shorter hospital stay, shorter ICU lets to stay, and better functional recovery, not being transfused. So red cells, don't fix anything in stable patients except the number on the hemoglobin. They generally do not make the patient better, they make the patient worse. I love transfusion, I studied it, I'm the chair of the transfusion committee, but I'm telling you, stable patient does not need red cells, okay, unless their hemoglobin is very low, in which case you should be seeing something like that. So, does decrease mortality, um, so it does help. Um, another, another study showing the same thing, uh, risk of mortality was cut down by almost by 25%. Um, not transfusing patients, you got a survival every 33 patients, which is pretty effective. Um, less rebleeding, less heart attack, less, cardi less congestive heart failure, and fewer infections, all strongly shown in this uh, trial, meta-analysis of three trials. Um, this is a meta-analysis of, of many ICU ones, and they looked at mortality, infections, MODs, and ARDS. And it, for trauma patients, um, three of the four studies showed um, less risk of death. Two of the general surgery studies, both of them showed that. Orthopedic studies didn't show a difference. For patients with heart attacks, three studies showed there was uh, benefit to restrictive. One study said not. But the study that didn't say a difference used a hemoglobin, a hematic rate of 36 versus 33, which is a pretty high target. Um, and so, um, and for ICU patients, uh, all four studies showed less transfusions were better. So since Hebert's study was done in the 1990s, the subsequent trials just broaden it, make it stronger and stronger. This is about the strongest evidence for anything we do in the ICU, is to not transfuse patients who are stable. 
Um, this is looking at the risk of infection. All studies show that less transfusions give you less infections. And this is the risk of uh, ARDS. And all but one study showed less ARDS with blood transfusion. So TRALI, which is transfusion-related acute lung injury, or TRADS, if you like, transfusion-related ARDS, is real. Some patients who get transfused will develop lung injury or ARDS. So it is real. And the risk, the odds ratio is two and a half times. So it does matter. All the, these are all the bad things that can happen with transfusion. I will bore you with all the details. Um, the risk of um, getting a virus like HIV or hepatitis C is much lower than now. It's down between one in a million and one in 10 million. Um, so viruses aren't really the problem, but bacteria, as you can see, can be quite dangerous, even though the risk there overall is about one in a million. Um, those are the current rates. Um, so HIV is one in 1.8 million units, HCV 1.16 and HPV. These are basically down, down to the rate of processing error more than the rate of actual risk of infection in the blood. Why does blood do such bad things to patients? It has a very strong immune effect. Um, giving blood really suppresses the patient's immunity. And there's a term called TRIM, which just means transfusion-associated immunomodulation. But basically, blood makes the patient less immune and more likely to get infected. Um, another study looking at, um, this is a, a um, meta-analysis looking at 20 peer-reviewed studies, 13,000 patients. The risk of infection goes up by 3.45 times with um, blood transfusion. Um, and in trauma, it goes up 5.26%. So of all the surgeons in the hospitals who hate excess transfusions, it should be the trauma surgeons who are the most against giving blood unnecessarily. So we give the blood when the patient's in shock. But when they're not in shock anymore and we're reaching our goals of resuscitation, the blood really should stop. Five times risk of, an, of infection with excess transfusion. Um, another one showing the same thing. These are looks of nosocomial infection. Um, a little term, but you can see that patients who are in the gray who got transfused had more than double the rate of infection than the patients who weren't transfused. So it's real. And so every medical group that think cares about transfusion um, has a target, and the usual target is seven. There's one or two that still use eight, but not many. Most of them use seven. Um, cardiovascular surgeons in 2011 were still talking about eight, but actually they they're now talking nine, uh, seven most of the time now. So we should only transfuse patients if they have a hemoglobin less than seven. That's an arbitrary number, but we chose that based on some data, and. They should only um, be transfused if they have evidence of symptoms or they are actually bleeding. If they're not bleeding, don't have symptoms, don't have any less than seven, why are you giving blood? It doesn't make any sense. So this is from the um, American Board of Internal Medicine and other societies, a top five list. Think bad things we do in ICU. Number one is ordering tests for no good reason. You know, oh, let's do a CBC every eight hours for the next three days. Why? Why are we doing that? And in fact, that actually contributes to anemia because you keep drawing blood, drawing blood, drawing blood. Guess what? The hemoglobin is starting to go down. Jeez, let's draw more blood and see why. So if we can track that, it goes below seven, I have to get blood. They're going down because you're taking out so much blood. Number two is don't transfuse patients with a hemoglobin uh, uh, greater than seven who are hemodynamically stable. Number three turns out to be TPN is not required in the first seven days of ICU. It just adds infections and complications. Number four is don't deeply sedate patients without a specific indication and without a daily awakening trial. And the last one is don't do stupid stuff like continue life support for patients at high risk of death or severely impaired functional recovery without offering patients and their families alternative of care focused entirely on comfort. So um, there's a time that everybody has to die and um, you don't have to die after a week of expensive care in the ICU. So how do we do at UCSD, looking back at our data? So around 2014, we started to look at this. Um, spoiler alert, uh, wasn't very good. So looking at all our transfusions, 32% of our transfusions were given for hemoglobin greater than eight. That's a third of transfusions, basically. And an awful lot of the time, two thirds of the time when um, we were transfusing blood, we were giving two units. So hemoglobin of eight and two units was pretty common, which is kind of dumb. Um, and if you looked at the pre-transfusion uh, hemoglobin, that is, what was the starting hemoglobin when they got the transfusion? If seven's a target, 
everybody was transfusing more than uh, hemoglobin A. The service that was the best was not surprisingly trauma, which was transfusing at a median hemoglobin of 7.3, but even we should have known better than that, although there may have been some shock patients in there. Um, and then, so that's okay. Did they really need that? Maybe these patients were bleeding. If they were bleeding, they sure hemoglobin shouldn't have gone up very much, right? So you give a patient hemoglobin of seven, one unit, they should go up to eight, two units, they should go up to, to nine, right? Well, guess what? Here's the post-transfusion hemoglobins. A lot of cases, they're over 10. Do these patients need transfusion? Nope. Most of our transfusions were probably unnecessary. And so that's kind of bad. Ouch. Ouch. Cost of this excess transfusion, we figured it's cost, it was costing about $3.3 million a year of unnecessary transfusions. Uh, that's a huge suck of money. I could see a lot better things I'd spend $3.3 million on in this place than blood transfusions. And so we were mediocre. I love this poster. Mediocrity takes a lot less time, and most people won't notice the difference until it's too late. <laughs> so there was a paper from Stanford saying that just by putting a, a BPA, a best practice advisory, in EPIC, and they use EPIC at Stanford, it cut down their transfusion. So basically a thing pops up and gives the last three hemoglobins and says, hey, hemoglobin's over seven, what are you doing? Give us a reason why you're giving us transfusion. And that just that extra little bit of work made people transfuse a lot less. And that was the results, basically. The top line is the, the red cells. They went down pretty good um, in both um, yearly uh, intervals. So they cut down the red cells. Didn't affect their plasma. But they say 1.6. So here's the UCSD BPA, basically almost the same thing. And they had to give a reason. The only ex exceptions were active or significant bleeding, uh, future procedure, patient having a heart attack, or um, acute cerebral ischemia. Um, those are the exceptions that are allowed. And last hemoglobin shows up there. And a slightly different one, if the hemoglobin uh, was over 8, um, there were less uh, contraindications. Basically, that'd be bleeding. So we had the Transfusion Wise campaign. You've seen the posters and the cards around. We had this, um, basically, these are the indications for transfusion now, stability, 7, significant symptoms, and single units, unless the hemoglobin is less than 6, in which case you can give 2 units. Um, and then prevent using prevent blood by not drawing, sucking blood of the patient all the time. And that's the card we use, that's the poster you've seen around. And did it work? Yes, it worked. Our transfusions began to drop. Um, the number of um, patients who needed blood um, didn't change very much, but the amount of blood they got started to go down. Um, and the number of discharge of transfusions started to go down with time. Um, you notice at first it didn't work and we realized the residents were finding a way to get around the BPA. They could get out of it. So we changed it so that it's very hard. You're still, you can still escape the BPA if you really know how to do it. I don't tell people how to do it. But um, you can see that when we finally, right there, fixed the BPA so that it could not be easily gotten out of, all of a sudden there was a big drop in transfusion. So basically, people transfuse when it's not annoying to do so. That's not a good reason to transfuse anybody. Um, there's a number of units, more than uh, two or more units. You can see that went down quite a lot, too. Um, and so that was persistent um, over time. Those numbers all went down. And um, this is what we looked like in 2015. Most of the services began to move down to the less transfused and less lower hemoglobin and less units of blood. There were a few problems, though, problem services, medicine at Hillcrest, bone marrow transplant, medicine at Thornton, and cardiology. But as we educated them, they all began to come down. And bone marrow transplant, which had been an outlier, became one of the more compliant ones. They used to argue, well, if we top the patient up, then they can stay out longer before they have to come back for a transfusion, because they're doing patients who get transfused fairly, fairly regularly. But even they started using a lower transfusion threshold without any apparent difference in, in outcomes. So that was better. And so all the groups now have been basically moving. One of the last group of outliers turned out to be um, uh, ortho spine, but we finally got them down as well. So as you can see, as time goes by, they get flatter and flatter using less and less blood. How much money did it save? Um, just that BPA and those cards, we figured it saved about a million dollars a year, at least, uh, maybe more. Uh, what's the card of transfusion lawsuit? 
The lawsuit for blood transfusion ranges between $1.1 and $17 million settlement. So you don't want to get any of those, that's for sure. So it worked. We reduced we had some transfusions. We're now thinking about what we can do about plasma platelets. Um, we do have a massive transfusion protocol. We've seen these signs around. The most important step of the massive transfusion protocol is to call the blood bank, to let them know that it's happening. And then it's very important that they get some kind of identification. The sign release form is nice, but the most important thing is they need to know an MRN and they need to know that you're actually having it, uh, having it happen so that they can get ready. These fridges, you may have seen these around. Anybody seen one of these yet? So this is what our massive transfusion. So we started there using these about a year and a half ago. And basically, it stops blood wastage. And so they should be able to give you a bunch of red cells and a bunch of plasma. Now remember, um, platelets are not refrigerated, so they don't go inside. They should always be on the outside because you don't want to refrigerate the platelets because they're not meant to be refrigerated. Um, and it's very important. There's lots of data out there saying that plasma is important. The ratio of plasma to red cells should be pretty close to one to one, and platelets should be one to two or so. Um, there's still some argument about that, but that's an important ratio. And that came out of a lot of experience in Iraq and Afghanistan, that higher plasma to red cell ratios do better. Um, there's two new studies that just came out this month, actually, uh, that you may be interested in, both using plasma in the pre-hospital phase. The first one came out of uh, Denver, and um, it looked at giving plasma to patients who were either in shock or shock and tachycardic in ambulances. So ambulances in, in uh, Colorado were given two units of plasma and they could give it to the patient when they were hypotensive. Um, and the patients they, they did tend to give it to were, were, who were in shock were pretty sick. Um, despite that, there was no difference in mortality at one month, um, whether they got regular saline or whether they got plasma. So pre-hospital plasma transfusion in this case didn't work, but there's a lot of enthusiasm to give plasma pre-hospital. Uh, more recently, just a, a week or so ago, another study came. This one came from multiple center trial. It was based out of, um, of uh, Pennsylvania, but it was actually um, a multi-institutional trial. And using helicopters, so flight nurses would give patients plasma and um, uh, two units if they were uh, uh, considered to be in shock. And interestingly here, there was a survival advantage. 30-day mortality was significantly lower in those patients who got plasma on mostly scene flights um, from the scene. 33% mortality without plasma, 23% were with mortality. Um, and then at 24 hours, the two groups got about the same amount of products. So, so it seems that in a helicopter, plasma works, but in an ambulance, it doesn't. Well, obviously, there's more to the story there. There must be some other differences in the patients, but there's more and more enthusiasm for getting blood products in the pre-hospital phase. So it may not be too long before we start seeing EMS starting to carry blood products or helicopters carrying more blood products. Um, there's some new products. Remember the old freeze-dry plasma? That's back. The U.S. Army has gotten permission from the FDA to use it. Um, it's a very interesting product because you could keep this on the shelf when you're ready to use it. You just rehydrate it and away you go. Um, so the military has it. It has not available when you're for Europe for a few years now. There's a, a company in France that makes it. But it's now available in the U.S. to the military. Whether it comes to the civilian market, we don't know, but the military is already trying with it. Basically, you get a bottle of freeze-dry plasma and a bottle of saline, and you mix them together. Another thing that's really uh, interesting is uh, whole blood. Whole blood is now becoming available in San Diego. Very soon, we will have whole blood. Whole blood is exactly what it is. It's blood that has not been separated. Now, normally, blood, they, uh, their blood bank separates it into red cells, plasma, and platelets, and cryo. When you get a unit of whole blood, that's basically right from the donor, has not been separated. So you're giving one unit, but you're giving a unit of red cells, a unit of plasma, a unit of platelets, units of cryo. But they're all matched to each other. It's fresh. It has to be less than five days old. And what's been noticed when we used to use walking blood donor uh, pools in Afghanistan and Iraq, because we used to start running low on blood, we'd have to start using the walking donor pool, that that blood stops bleeding more effectively than the fractionated blood. So um, Scripps is doing this. We will soon be doing this. So we will probably have a small number of units, probably not more than four or five, for massive transfusion only. Can um, It was available way back, way, way back. But um, over time, the blood units, I don't want to say how far back, but since the 70s, the blood banks don't usually give us whole blood. The only people who get whole blood was um, uh, was the uh, there was a pediatric hospital, 
um, but we haven't seen it since the 70s. And that was because um, the blood bank felt there was more value in fractionating blood, but for, for trauma patients, the mass transfusion protocol, so I anticipate we will have this within the next year. Um, liquid plasma. This is plasma that's never been frozen. This has been available in some parts of the country for some time now, and it may be coming to us as well. This is plasma that, because it's never been frozen, it's only been kept cold, um, it doesn't have as much storage defect, so it may be more effective for patients who are bleeding. Um, it does have a shelf life of about 26 days, um, and the way it's used is in massive transfusion protocol, you use it before you give FFP. Because it's liquid, it doesn't need to be thawed. We use about 60 units of plasma a day in our system, so there's no reason we have to freeze all of our plasma. We could have some liquid plasma because you're going to get The only thing is, there's a kind of a relative shortage of plasma, so you're not always going to get A, B. Sometimes you're just going to get what's they call low titer A, which is an A donor who has low B titer, so the chance of a B person reacting to, to it is low. Um, cold store platelets, this is something that the military has gotten approval from the FDA. It's not as useful for us, but the idea is um, if you, instead of um, keeping the platelets at room temperature, you cool them down, they'll have a longer shelf life. More of an issue for the military because if you think about it, you got a five-day shelf life, you collect platelets in the U.S. and you want to send them to Afghanistan, by the time they get there, they're already almost expired. So what do they do in Afghanistan and Iraq when they need platelets? They have to do platelets for in the in the combat zone which is very inconvenient, right? So they're still searching for a way to get platelets overseas. I don't think this will be, have much impact on us, but um, it's something that's being done. But something that also is interesting is there are some jurisdictions, this is in Texas, where apparently EMS is set up differently. There are some fire chiefs in Texas that are now putting whole blood on their ambulances. And the idea was, okay, a guy gets a gunshot wound, he's bleeding out in the ambulance, we'll give him the whole blood on the way to the trauma center. So that was the idea. However, since they've done it, most of the units they've given have been to patients who tried to have a baby at home or accidentally had a baby outside the hospital and were bleeding, rushing to the hospital. That's where most of the units have been actually being given. But they, it is being carried in Texas. Interestingly, I guess in Texas, the EMS system is set up differently where the medical direction, the fire chief can decide to get blood. I don't know how, which blood bank gave them the whole blood, but that's what they're doing. So. So there is a lot more enthusiasm. So it will not be too long, I think, that we'll see whole blood in our hospital, and we'll see EMS maybe starting to carry either freeze-dried plasma or plasma. And we may have liquid plasma before too long, which will maybe get us plasma faster because it's going to be ready to go. What currently happens is our blood bank keeps a small number of units thawed all the time, at least they're supposed to. So they're always supposed to have four units of, of plasma thawed all the time. Sometimes they do, sometimes they don't, but usually they do. But the idea of the Liquid plasma has never been frozen, so it's ready to go. Um, and as long as you're using it, it's acceptable because there's no wastage. So I'm going to quit there. Um, that's as much as I can tell you in transfusion <laughs> short period of time. Any questions about transfusion? If you ever have any questions, I'm on, like I'm still the chair of the transfusion committee, so if you have any questions about transfusion or something that didn't seem to go right or whatnot, please let me know, and I can usually find out what happened. So have, how have you found mass transfusions lately? Have they been smoother? I think the big fridges help too, especially yeah, in the OR. You can yeah. Take them with you. yeah, we're wasting a lot less blood than we used to. So thanks very much. I won't keep you from your lunch any longer. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you.